Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. How do you relate to God? That might sound like an odd question, but do you relate to him on, on your terms or on his terms? And maybe I'll use an, ob- we have an object lesson right here, actually. Abby, who will be baptized this morning, has she earned your guys' love? Has she done the dishes or vacuumed or done anything yet? No, no babies, babies can't earn our love, can they? Our relationship with babies is more about us as parents giving them our love even though they don't really deserve it. And, and that's how we relate to God, that God loves us even though we don't really re- deserve it. That's relating to God on his terms. So we'll explore a little bit further what that means in our worship today. Please join in singing our first hymn, hymn 397.
remain seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity, but I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in His promise, you have brought this child to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Receive the sign of the cross on your head and on your heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. You can bring her over to the font. Abigail Lynn Culver, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Please stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach His precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love, therefore, urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Abigail Lynn Culver may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, through your stern judgment, the unbelieving world was destroyed by the flood. But according to your great mercy, you saved Noah and his family. You engulfed stubborn Pharaoh and his army in the waters of the Red Sea, but led your people through those same waters to safety on dry land. In the waters of the Jordan, your own son was baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit. 
By these signs you foreshadowed the precious cleansing bath which you give us in holy baptism. Clinging to your command and promise, we ask that you would look with favor on Abigail. Through this water of baptism, drown in her all sin inherited from Adam and any other evil she may do. Set her apart from the unbelieving world and hold her safe and secure in the holy ark of the church. Keep her always fervent in spirit and joyful in hope, so that she may honor your holy name and at last receive, together with all your people, the promised inheritance of eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for hymn number 300. Please stand for prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent comes to us from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Israel had tried to relate to God on its own terms. It had relied on the fact that they were God's chosen people, that they were just merely going through the motions of worship. They were still bringing their sacrifices, but their, their heart was not in it. They, they trusted that they could find military alliances that would keep them safe from the, the punishment that God promised was coming because of their idolatry and their unbelief. The first 12 chapters are filled with with warnings from God to Israel that if you continue to try to relate to me based on what you do, you're going to be lost. Babylon will sweep in and destroy you just like it destroyed the northern kingdom. But here in chapter 12, we have a little bit of good news. Isaiah's reminder to them that while they and we cannot relate to God on the basis of our own works because nothing we do is perfect, salvation comes from God. The way to relate to our Lord is not based on us, but on Him and His free and full grace. Isaiah writes, 
In that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you comfort me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust him and will not be afraid. Because Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his name. Declare among the peoples what he has done. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done amazing things. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, daughter of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is great among you. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 32 on page 78. second lesson comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 8, the first 10 verses. Here Paul kind of talks about human beings, about us, as if we were computers. You know how computers have different operating systems. And what Paul is saying here is that in humans, in us, there are only two possible operating systems. You either operate on the basis of the sinful flesh or you operate on the basis of the spirit. The the sinful flesh believes that we relate to God by our obedience to him, by by our keeping of God's law. Well, Paul says very clearly that operating system, that way of relating to God only leads to condemnation and death. However, on the other hand, we have the operating system of the Spirit, the one that was just given to Abby in, in Holy Communion, the one in which we relate to God not based on our works, but based on God's love. And that operating system leads only to no condemnation, but rather salvation. Paul writes, So then there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. 
Indeed, what the law was unable to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did when he sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. God condemned sin in his flesh, so that the righteous decree of the law should, would be fully satisfied in us who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To be sure, those who are in harmony with the sinful flesh think about things the way the sinful flesh does. And those in harmony with the Spirit think about things the way the Spirit does. Now, the way the sinful flesh thinks results in death, but the way the Spirit thinks results in life and peace. For the mindset of the sinful flesh is hostile to God, since it does not submit to God's law, and in fact, it cannot, those who are in the sinful flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the sinful flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed God's Spirit lives in you. And if someone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that person does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, number 384.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. We read selected verses from Luke chapter 15. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He told them this parable. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country. There he wasted his wealth with reckless living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He would have liked to fill his stomach with the carob pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, and I am dying from hunger? I will get up, go to my father, and tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He got up and went to his father. While he was still far away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, hugged his son, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Then they began to celebrate. His older son was in the field. As he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant told him, Your brother is here. Your father killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. The older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. He answered his father, Look, these many years I've been serving you, and I never disobeyed your command. But you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours arrived after wasting your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. The father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the gospel of our Lord, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, the Son that God sent to find and save us. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly or spiritual meaning. Jesus told this parable in particular to some people who were grumbling about the company that he kept. They saw as he welcomed what they called sinners, which were open sinners, prostitutes. They they grumbled because he invited and he ate with tax collectors. These were the opposite of your good, upstanding, church-going folk. These were the people that you would never anticipate seeing in church, much less in heaven. And yet Jesus welcomed them. He even ate with them. At that time, table fellowship indicated the closest possible fellowship between people. And they grumbled about it. They hated him for it. And so Jesus explains what this is all about by means of a parable. He takes them on a trip to the lost and found. Actually, this parable is the third of three parables, and they all relate to each other. They build upon one another. In the first parable, uh, a shepherd has 100 sheep, and one of them goes missing, and the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one. He finds it, brings it home, and he tells his neighbors, and he throws a party. They celebrate. In the second parable, a woman loses a coin in her house, and she turns the house upside down until she finds that coin. And then when she finds it, she calls her neighbors and her friends and says, come on over, we'll celebrate what was lost is now found. That culminates now in this parable, where it's not a coin or a sheep that is lost, but a son. Two sons, in fact, are lost. Parable goes this way. A man had two sons. Apparently, the younger son could not wait for his dad to die. He wanted he asked him for his share of the estate. In those days, the older, oldest male son would receive 
a double portion of this. So, so what the father did was really split it into three parts. Two parts went to the older son. One part went to the younger son. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, if one of your children came to you and said, I want my inheritance now? They're really wishing for you to be dead, right? The more shocking part is that the father does it. The father gives him his share of the estate. Right there, we already have an example of grace, right? He doesn't deserve this. If this was my son, I'd say, you get out those doors right now before, I, before you don't, before you can't leave, right? Um, but the father in this parable gives him his share of the inheritance. And then the younger son does what, what many people in this situation do when they have too much money, they don't know what to do with it. He wastes the wealth, his father's wealth, with reckless living. What exactly kind of living was it? Was it prostitutes? Was it gambling? Was it alcohol? Was it a failed business venture? Who knows? Who cares? It doesn't matter. All that matters is that the wealth was gone. His father's inheritance, his share of it, was gone. To make matters worse, there was a severe famine in that land. We know how that goes, right? When it rains in life, it pours. You lose your job and your health insurance at the same time that you need surgery and your furnace breaks down and your car needs new tires. It all seems to pile up all at once. So here the, the younger son is. He's, he's homeless. He's broke. But he's not yet broken. He's still determined to live life his way. He's still determined to prove that he doesn't need his father's love. He doesn't need his father's house. He definitely doesn't need his father's rules. He's still going to do it his way. And so he takes a job feeding pigs, which for a little Jewish boy is about as low as you can go. Pigs were off limits. Still today, for kosher Jews, pigs are off limits. No bacon, no pork chops for them. And yet he's feeding them. And the text says that he ached to eat some of the carob pods that the pigs were eating. He's broke, he's hungry, he's hopeless. And now finally, his independent, rebellious spirit is starting to crack, isn't it? Jesus says, he came to his senses. And then he came up with this plan. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And I am dying from hunger. Here's his plan. I will get up, go to my father and tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And off he went. Can you picture him on that road from that far off country back home practicing this little speech in his mind, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your... He's hopeless, isn't it? He tried to live life his way, on his terms, and it broke him. The world broke him. You know how that goes, Right? Maybe you've been in this position before too, where you run away from your father's house. You run away from his rules and his love. You find it to be too restrictive. You try to live life on your terms. You want to find yourself in the world. And yet what often ends up happening is that you end up totally lost, totally broken. See, the devil likes to hang the world and the supposed freedom that it offers to live however you want, to hold it in front of our eyes and say, this is what you really need. This is going to bring you pleasure and happiness and joy to live life on your terms, not, not according to God's rules, not according to God's commands. Live life the way you want to. And if you've ever tried that, if you've ever run away from your father's house and his rules and his love, and you've tried your hand at living life in this world, what have you realized? That this world is a cruel, cold place that will eat you up and spit you out broken just like it did with this younger son. For all of the, uh, the allure that Satan tries to, to make the world appear like, how bright and shiny he makes it appear to live life on your terms. You know, kind of like the, the proverbial... Go to Sin City, go to Las Vegas, and you can, everything that happens in Vegas will stay in Vegas. You know what? A lot of people leave Vegas broke, and a lot of people leave there broken. 
That is what happens when you abandon your father's house and his rules and his love. That's what happened to this younger son. That's what happened to us. Maybe you know someone who's going through that situation right now. Someone who has, was raised in the church, was baptized at a font like that, was confirmed, and now has said, I don't want anything to do with my father's house or his rules or his word and sacrament. Maybe you're going through a stage like that right now. Sometimes God lets us go our way. This is not a prison here. Anyone is free to go anytime you want to try your hand at life in this cold, cruel world. Sometimes God uses the world to bring us to repentance. And what we see here in this younger man is really a picture of repentance. Him crawling back on his hands and knees to his father, that's what repentance looks like. And God works repentance in many different ways. He, he worked it this morning on little Abby by, by washing her with water word by, by cleansing her of her sins and creating in her that new operating system, that operating system that operates based on the Spirit. God works repentance in us by, by inviting us to come here and confess our sins publicly and to be absolved of them. Maybe God leads us to repentance by sending a, a friend or a family member or a pastor into our lives to say, you are walking away from God. You are living in rebellion against His will, and if you keep on going down this path, the only thing that lay at the end is death and hell. If none of those work, the final step that God takes to bring someone to repentance is to declare them excommunicated outside of the church, outside of His house, outside of His love. But sometimes God just uses life to do it, to break us to bring us to repentance. He just lets life in this cruel world break us, break our spirit, break our rebellious will so that we come to understand what the psalmist meant in Psalm 32. Many are the woes of the wicked. And you know that. If you've ever tried to live life on your terms, you know that. It only leads to woe. It only leads to sadness. It only leads to broken hearts and broken families and broken souls. But as harsh as it may sound that God would allow us, would allow the world to break us, He does it for a good reason. He does it to bring, him, bring us back to Himself so that we would fall on His undeserved love, His amazing grace. And that's what we see here too, right? Undeserved love. As the sun is walking back, and He's probably just a speck on the horizon, His, son, his Father sees Him. He must have been looking for Him, right? Waiting, hoping, pleading, praying that his son would come back. And when he does, when he sees his son, he goes sprinting out there to meet him. Now, no self-respecting Jewish adult man would ever run. That's dishonorable for an adult man to run. But he runs out to meet his son and he grabs him up and he kisses him. This son that probably still smells like pig manure. The son tries to give his little speech, right? Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And, and the father will have none of it. He says, ah, enough of that. He, he orders his servants to go get the best robe to cover up his, his filthy son, to get uh, the family ring to put on his finger to show that he's part of the family again, to put sandals on his blistered feet. That's undeserved love. But that's the joy that the father has over receiving back his son who had been dead to him who is now alive, who is lost and now is found. That's the other side of repentance, a side that we sometimes misunderstand. I think we sometimes think of repentance as a negotiation with God. God, if you just forgive me this one time, I will be better. I will try harder. I will give you more in my offerings. I will serve you with my life. That is not repentance. Repentance is not a negotiation. We are not making a deal with God when we confess our sins. In fact, true repentance understands that our sins are forgiven before we even say a word. So deep is God's love for us that our sins are forgiven before we confess them at all. Every last one of them paid for by Jesus on the cross. Then we have the older son. He's still out working in the field and he hears the sound of celebration going on, the singing and the music and the dancing. And he asks one of the servants, what's, what's going on here? And the servant says, well, your brother's back and your, your father's 
slaughtered the fattened calf to celebrate that his son who was dead is now alive again, who is lost is now found. And the older son is absolutely furious. He wants nothing to do with it. Even after his father goes out and pleads with him, he won't come in to celebrate. He won't come in to the party. He says this, Look, these many years I've been serving you and I never disobeyed your command, but you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours arrived after wasting your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. In other words, I'll be damned before I go in there and celebrate your love to this undeserving son of yours who wasted, squandered your property. The father loves him too much to let him off that easily, though. He says to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours, but it was fitting to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's really remarkable, isn't it, at the end of the parable? Which of the sons is lost, is left out in the cold? It's not the one who, who went and wasted his father's inheritance with prostitutes and gambling or whatever it was. Not the one who came home smelling like pigs, but the good, upstanding son. The one who always did what his father wanted, who was left outside of the party in the cold. And why? Why didn't the older son get to participate in the celebration? It wasn't because of his, his younger brother's reckless living. It wasn't because of his father's outrageous love for his younger son. No, it was purely because of his self-righteousness. He thought, he figured that he had deserved, he had earned his father's love. Not understanding that the whole time that he lived in his father's house, even as he was working, it was his father's love that made him a member of that family. Just as, just as for Abby, Abby has done nothing to earn her parents' love. It's simply a pure gift that you give to her. Just like the father gave the older son and the younger son all everything out of pure love. If there is one reason, however, that, that many people will end up going to hell on Judgment Day and not to heaven, it is because of self-righteousness. It is because many people think they don't need God's grace. They don't need God's love. They're good enough on their own. They would never think of humbling themselves into coming here to this place and announcing in public, I am a sinner who does not deserve God's love. I do not deserve to be called his child. That self-righteousness will, will wind up leading a lot of people to hell. So what's this parable all about? Well, first of all, it's about the third son. Did you, did you catch the third son in there? He's the one telling the parable. Jesus. Jesus is the one who gave up all the riches, all the wealth of heaven to come down to the pig pen of this earth. However, there are big differences between Jesus and, and that younger son. Jesus didn't squander his father's inheritance. We did that. Jesus didn't take his father's wealth and all of his blessings and waste them. We did. We were the ones who, who took God's gifts of health and wealth and money and the means of grace and, and wasted them. Going, trying to live life on our terms rather than according to his will. We are the reason that Jesus had to come down to the pig pen of this earth surrounded by the slop of sin and death. We are the reason that Jesus had to be hung on a cross between two thieves and give up his life. Jesus was the one who was truly lost when his father turned his back on him and abandoned him to hell. And we see Jesus lost on the cross as we hear him crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Understand that that is the declaration we deserved. The second big difference between Jesus and the other son is that Jesus did have to earn his father's love. The father said, You have to live a perfect life. And then you have to carry the sins of the world to the cross where I'm going to stomp the heel of my wrath into you and crush you. But Jesus did it. God the Father exalted him to the, the throne that is above all thrones so at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This parable is also about us too, right? 
Haven't we often tried to live life on our own terms, even though we were lost? Did you know that all of us were lost? Abby was lost until this morning. She was born with sin, inherited from her parents and they from theirs all the way back to Adam. She was lost, as good as dead, until God found her at that font and made her alive. He did that with each of us. But how have we said thanks to God for that? How often have we acted like that younger brother and just wasted all of the gifts that God has given us? Wasted our time. Wasted our talents. Wasted our wealth. That inheritance, that rich inheritance that God has given us and wasted it on on pleasing ourselves. On living life on our terms rather than according to our Father's will. We deserve to be thrown out of His house. And sometimes... He has allowed life to break us, hasn't he? He has forced us through the hardship of this cold, cruel world to come crawling back to him on our hands and knees, begging, pleading, Father, I no longer deserve to be called your son or daughter. And you know what? Every time we do that, every single time, the Father forgives us. Every single time, actually, he's the one running out to find us and wrap his arms around us and cover up our filth with the righteousness that Jesus purchased for us. No matter how far gone you've been, no matter how long you've been away from your Father's house, no matter how much you have rebelled against Him and brought shame to His name, His arms, His doors are always open for you. Amazing grace indeed. In the end, this parable isn't as much about the the two sons as it is about the Father's extraordinary, I might even call it outrageous love and grace. This love that only a father could give. That is not based in what his sons did or didn't do, but rather based simply in his beating heart. You know, it's interesting. We don't hear what happened to the older son, whether he ever came into the party to celebrate his father's outrageous love or not. And I think Jesus ends it there on purpose. I think he wants us to walk out those doors wondering, thinking, will I? Will I go in and celebrate the Father's outrageous grace to both open sinners and lifelong churchgoers? Will I enjoy how deep and wide and high my Father's love is? Will you? Amen. Please stand for the response. Please be seated.
We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that you have placed into our hands. We ask you not only to accept our gifts, but also our praise and our thanksgiving. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the responsive prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear an anthem from our Sunday school children.
Please stand for prayer and blessing. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn, number 379. Once again, good morning. morning. Glad to have you all here this morning. Just a couple quick announcements. Our midweek Lenten devotions continue this Wednesday at 6.30, preceded by Soup Supper at 5.30. Uh, This week we will look at the repentant thief. Uh, Again, the Easter breakfast sign-up sheet can be found on the white table just outside the doors there. Uh, We praise the Lord this morning for making Abigail Lynn Culver a member of his family, his precious daughter. We ask that the Lord would keep Abby in her baptismal grace until he takes her home to heaven. And thank you to Sunday school children, teachers, parents for their work this morning. We really appreciate the timely reminder that Jesus does receive sinners. Always my privilege to proclaim the word of God to you, especially today as we consider uh, a trip to the lost and found where the Lord came searching for us, he found us, and he saved us. It's all grace. 
It's nothing about us. It's all about God. It's all about His undeserved love for us. May God bless your day and the rest of your week. Thank you.